Enjoy with your headphones for a better listening experience. Please watch till the end of the video to have you most scariest part of the video. Serious, eerie towns, disappearing diners, and creepy gas stations, what's your true, unexplained story of being in a place that shouldn't exist? When my brother and I were 10 and 12 respectively our family went on a hike through the cemetery and into the woods not far from our house. My brothers and I would explore these woods every day. Even camped in them before. We knew it like the back of our hands. Anyway, as the family hit our usual spot by the creek halfway through brother one and I said we'd be back in a few, we wanted to wander off further up creek. So, we did. We came across a very large hill we had never seen before. It was littered with what looked like someone's worldly possessions. As if they turned the house upside down, shook out the contents, took the house and left. There were tons of painted as on the trees showing someone intended to cut them down at some point. We poked around for a few when we thought we heard our mom hollering at us. So, we turned our tail and walked maybe 20 feet back down the hill to where our parents were. The entire encounter was maybe 45 minutes long, on our end. As soon as our mom saw us we got the beating of a lifetime. We had actually been gone almost 4 hours. She never saw us walk up any hill and remembered seeing us meandering down the straight path by the creek, not turning up a hill that was 20 feet away. She and her husband and our other brother combed the woods for over 4 hours screaming our names and couldn't find hide nor tail of us. We pleaded our case and even tried showing her the hill. Surely she was messing with us. So, we stopped up to the turn off for the hill and, it was gone. Nowhere to be seen. For years we explored the woods determined to find that hill. We covered miles and miles of off-path woods. As we got older we mapped it out. To this day, that hill does not exist. We never found it again. Never found the weird furniture, toys, clothes, and other household items that were scattered across the hill. And never met anyone in the area that had a clue about the hill. We probably just wandered way further than we meant to, but I always found it weird that we never found the hill again. Many years ago, two of my best friends and I decided to go for a day of mountain biking at Snowshoe in southern W.VA. Now this was way before the days of GPS, so we were kinda doing this by some half directions and an old map, but the point is we got very lost. Sometime along the way we ended up in this very tiny, small town and we figured we would ask for directions it was absolutely deserted. I'm talking not a single soul to be seen anywhere. We parked the truck and split up looking for anyone. Now this was at around 9 to 10 a.m. so not exactly the ass crack of dawn mind you. We went into the post office, nobody, we went into the only bar in town, which was unlocked, unattended with music playing, but not a single soul present. We went business to business to business and walked the streets and after about 25 minutes finally found one old guy who just seemed to appear out of nowhere in the middle of town walking alone. The first question we asked him wasn't even for directions. It was where the hell is everyone to which he replied, well I guess folks round here don't get up much till round noon. We asked him for directions to Snowshoe and he pointed to the road we came in on and said to go that way about 10 miles and make a right and we will find the interstate. We left quickly. We all had a bad sense of unease about the whole thing. As we left we were about 5 miles down the road and hit a lady dressed up in a state road uniform standing in the middle of a very long straightaway holding a stop sign. When we approached her she turned the sign from slow to stop. We asked what was going on. She stated that there was road construction ahead. We told her of what just happened and she just kinda laughed and said those people in that town are kinda strange, but let it slide. So, we actually started talking to her waiting for a line of traffic to come by from the opposite direction. We actually ended up talking to her for about 45 minutes to an hour, just shooting it. Kinda got lost in the convo. Not one single vehicle ever approached from the other direction or behind us. Eventually she said, well I guess it's clear now and y'all can go ahead and slowly turn the sign from stop to slow and motion for us to go ahead. We went straight ahead, the only direction you could possibly go for the next 30 some odd miles and didn't see any signs of construction, state road workers, or maintenance going on at all. She had no vehicle, we figured she was a flag woman dropped off by some crew up ahead. After the encounter with the town and this woman we had enough and called it quits. We turned on the interstate as soon as we found it and headed north and home. 
Every single one of us still remembers this whole encounter in vivid detail to this day. I asked my friend about it actually about three months ago at this wedding and it still freaks him out to no end. This took place when I was 13. No one in my family will acknowledge it happened, the only ones who would cave to my but great-grandpa have unfortunately passed away. No one will give me the time of day about it. My family has a cabin in Cook's Forest, Clarion, Pennsylvania cabin was built by my great-granddad and has expanded a bit over the years but has a nice little nook at the bottom of a long dirt road off the main road and down a hill. There are a few other properties around, but most are up and off on the dirt road, only one is down the hill and only halfway at that. It's not modern by any means, no internet, cell service, the TV still has dials you have to twist to get to watch a DVD. It's very rustic and I love it. The property halfway down the hill is visible from any part at the front of our cabin, which is where the kitchen window, parking, porch, and fire pit are. For as long as anyone can remember, it's been this abandoned lot that had what was once a cabin with a concrete basement. The cabin was built on a hill, so half the basement stuck out from the hill, but the remaining part was crumbling. It also was at the fork where we would ride our ATVs to get to the fire break, so even though it could have been creepy it was a quite common and familiar sight. Until one Memorial Day, which is when we opened the cabin after the winter and a large part of our family would go to the cabin for the long weekend to spend time together. Everyone would usually get there in the early evening, and then all come together for my great-granddad's dinosaur pancakes for breakfast, the highlight of my single digit to preteen years. So, I wake up, expecting to smell pancakes and hear chatter from the older members of my family down in the kitchen, but nothing. I assume I've gotten up too early and go downstairs to use the bathroom and then go back to sleep. Looking back, the whole upstairs was just mattresses with an aisle between them, I should have noticed that most beds were empty. I go downstairs and see all the adults outside, and I go out to say good morning and demand my T-Rex pancakes. I walk out and see all my family adults in a kind of semicircle facing an older man and a woman I didn't recognize. I assume this is some adult situation, so I go back inside to wake up my cousins, but not before looking at the clock in the microwave and seeing that it's about 3 p.m. Now, I love the cabin. I doodle the cabin itself, for wheelers, and the area around it for months leading up to Memorial Day weekend. I was usually up at the ass crack of dawn because I was so damn excited to just be there. Sleeping until 3 p.m. was not in any way normal. I wake my cousins up and by the time they all moss downstairs the adults are all back inside. Everyone is pretty silent but then great grandpa fires up the stove and gets us kids excited for dino cakes, so all seems normal. I was there with my one of my aunts and my uncle, no parents, and my aunt is pretty close in age to me and was for sure the cool aunt. So, when I saw her pale as a sheet I went to ask what's wrong. She took me outside and pointed at the aforementioned abandoned and crumbling property. In its place was a sprawling cabin mansion, parking area full of SUVs and the coolest looking four-wheelers my 13-year-old self had ever seen. Aunt tells me that the owners had come to say hi, the couple I saw earlier, and invited us over to hang out with their nieces and nephews, as they were having a Memorial Day get-together just like us. Me, having zero thought besides awesome four-wheelers, almost ran to the house, but my aunt caught me and rather forcefully reminded me of my Dino Cakes. I conceded and ran back inside to an atmosphere so thick with tension that even my undeveloped brain, thanks to our mom, could detect it. The oldest of the adults were acting normal and playing around with us kids, but something was very off. I finally asked WTF was up, and my aunt bonked me in the head and asked if I had seen that massive cabin mansion last night, last year, the year before? We'd come to the cabin every few weeks until December, did I see any construction? Well... No. But they invited us over and they have cool four-wheelers and Beth, come on. A resounding N.O. from multiple family members made my emotional girl self almost flee and cry, until my grandpa, a six feet seven inches hulk of a man, got down to my level and explained that he felt there was something weird going on. He said the couple didn't act right, I assumed that meant they were rude, and that we should just keep to ourselves this weekend. I agreed and we went about our day, all adults keeping us occupied with activities either inside or behind the cabin. We get ready for bed when I see my great granddad, World War II vet, who had the only bedroom on the first floor loading three shotguns, handing one off to my grandpa and the other to my uncle slash cool aunt's husband. 
To my shock and awe, my Grammy pulls out a, bedazzled, Glock from her purse. I go to bed with images of my little Grammy taking down a bunch of bad guys with her shiny pistol. I wake up the next day to the smell of pancakes and the sound of adults chatting downstairs. I'm sad because today is when we have to pack and leave, but things seem back to normal so I'm very glad. I run downstairs, note that the clock says 7.30, but ignore the weirdness and sit in front of a plate of Dino cakes that I dig into, while asking my aunt what time we have to leave. Leave? We don't leave until tomorrow. Wait, what day is it? It's Saturday, we just got here last night. I notice just a bit of doubt in my aunt's eyes that I know something is up, and I run outside. The abandoned lot is back to its decrepit state. I resolve to brush it off and enjoy my ATV riding and forget about everything pretty quickly. It wasn't until I got back to school and was called to the central office where they asked why I wasn't at school on Monday. I told them that today was Monday, WTF are they talking about? Nope, it's Tuesday, and my absence was unexplained despite several calls, I skipped school frequently, to my parents, divorced, neither of which were at the cabin. So, either my family played the trick of all tricks on me, or I'm living in an alternate universe or I can sleep into the afternoon. Like I said, no one will even remotely entertain a conversation about this incident, so I'm left telling my fellow Redditors about my family's conspiracy against me. My grandparents had a big farm when I was growing up and all of the grandkids would help work it over the summer when we were out of school. Anytime we saw a rabbit we were supposed to get it with the hoe or grab the shotgun. I was around 12 or so when I saw a little rabbit in the beans, and I didn't want my grandfather to see it, so I tried to chase it off. Followed it into the brush on the land, and for whatever reason I just kept following it because usually I'd lose sight of them pretty quickly once they hit the brush. Kept following it until I found what was clearly an old barn ruin. These are pretty normal to happen upon where I'm from and they're fun to look around inside, so I went in. It was weirdly kept up really well with antique tools in great shape and fresh hay. I worried I had crossed into our neighbor's property, so I hightailed it out of there. I asked my grandfather about it, and he said our land went far past what I had described, and I couldn't have left our land in the short amount of time I was gone, so he followed me out there and we couldn't find it. I checked every summer I worked there and never found it again. Not creepy, but it always drove me crazy where that stupid barn went. In the seventh grade I had a friend that lived near a beach on a bay of Lake Michigan. One day in early May it reached 70 degrees, nearly unheard of for that time of year in northern Wisconsin. My two friends, including the beach friend, excitedly rode our bikes down to the beach to maybe dip our toes in, expecting still frigid waters, and then tan for the rest of the afternoon. The water, though, was surprisingly warm. Like bath water warm. In this particular area of the bay the water was shallow for about a half mile out, and we joyously splashed around, wading deeper and deeper until we were about chest deep. As we dunked each other and swam with abandon I started to feel sick. Bad headache, nausea, wobbly. Just then, my other two friends mentioned that they also felt sick. We headed back to shore, nearly crawling by the time we got out. The three of us collapsed under a tree and fell asleep for two-ish hours. When we woke up we talked about how weird it was. I dipped my toe back in the water and it was freezing cold. To this day, I have no idea what was in there. I do know that there is a chemical plant in town that used to manufacture things like Agent Oranges, and that their practices were known to be less than environmentally conscious. I have never touched that water since. Was driving through Illinois to get to Chicago about a decade ago with a group of friends and we stopped at a Taco Bell. The first thing we noticed was that the workers were acting very oddly. Everything they said was monotone and rehearsed. After sitting in this fairly busy restaurant for a bit, we kind of all just looked at each other at the same time as we realized that none of the conversations happening around us made any sense. The people were speaking, and it was English, but the sentences weren't logical. They were just saying words to each other. We didn't say much about it until we got outside, at which point we all freaked out and confirmed each other's experiences at once and get out of there. We jokingly refer to that place as the NPC training center since the people didn't seem to be real, or they were learning how to be human or something. Still freaks me out. This happened to a friend of mine about 20 years ago. 
He had been working as an installer of double glazed windows and would often find himself traveling with a crew all over Kent and the southeast of the UK. One job he was doing wasn't all that far from home, so they decided to drive home instead of staying over in the Bob. They set off home quite late in the evening and it was already dark, there wasn't much on the roads, and it was pretty cold so not many pedestrians were about. They were going along one fairly straight bit of road when they passed through a fairly unremarkable village. It had the usual things like a pub and a corner shop, but little more else than cottages. About five minutes later a couple of his crew were complaining that they really needed a drink and there must be a pub somewhere. He suggested that they turn around and go back to the village. They turned around, drove back, and there was no village there. It was just fields. There weren't any turn-offs, so they couldn't have been mistaken. It was just one straight road. By my hometown there was a hiking trail that people went to very infrequently. It was along the side of the Niagara Escarpment so it had some climbable cliffs and some very shallow caves that you could crawl around on. I went with some friends when I was 1920 and we were crawling around and found a cave that went pretty deep. We had never been in there before, had never even seen it before. So, we pushed forward and decided to check it out even though we had no flashlights, and this was when cell phones didn't really have a flashlight function. We stepped into the cave, and it was easily 20 to 30 degrees cooler than outside. Upon looking around with which light we had we noticed it was really clean inside the cave, as it didn't have beer cans littered everywhere like all the other small caves did. While there we got a really eerie feeling after being in there shortly, hearing weird and strange things. Feeling like we were being touched, poked, and pulled and not having any way to figure out who was doing it because it was too dark. We were just using lighters to see what us was around. We were convinced one of us was messing with the others. Although any time we sparked a lighter, we were all decently far apart. We decided to hightail it out of there after only a few minutes, convinced to come back with flashlights. We came out to see that it was now dusk outside, when we entered it was midday. Somehow we had lost roughly three hours inside of this cave. We went with back with flashlights the next week. But have never been able to find this cave again. This story takes place in the mid-90s, a time before widely used cell phones and GPS. My two best friends and I freshly able to drive decided we would head out on a Saturday to a water park in southern Missouri about a three-hour drive from our hometown in northwest Arkansas. We had never been before and just used road maps to get there. We had a pretty fantastic time, but as the sun started to reach the tree line we thought we ought to head home. It was about 7 o'clock and we missed a turn but my friend Paul who was navigating said not to worry another turn was coming up that would get us there just as fast. The next turn took us from detour to completely lost. By 8 o'clock we are on a road that seemed to be lacking in informative road signs and zero lights. We finally see a gas station and are relieved to get some directions as well as some gas. My friend Taylor and I go inside while Paul pumps the gas. We come inside and a very friendly old man in his early 60s who gives us a large grin and says well hello there it was very foghorn leghorn-esque. Looked like an extreme hillbilly but very pleasant. We explained that we needed gas and wanted to fill up. He explained that he was about to shut down for the night but would be happy to oblige us. He then said something I'll never forget, you have to make haste though, tonight is buffer night. Taylor and I looked at each other and shared an awkward look. We asked him if he could point out our location on the road map. While he was finding it two people entered the shop from the back and called out for the old man. He said he was up front. The two approached us, a man and a woman, and at first looked confused then as though hit with an epiphany they smiled. They asked the old man, are these the guests tonight? He shot them a look and said, no these are some lost children. The way he said children caused the hairs on my neck to stand up. Not sure why. They looked at us and said, the three of you should make haste, because tonight is buffer night. Two things scared me right then. The first being how did they know about Paul pumping gas out front when they came from the back and the second being that they repeated the old man verbatim. We clarified the directions to get back on a main highway and paid for the gas without waiting for change. Taylor and I booked it out of the gas station to find Paul already in the passenger seat. When we got into the car we were nearly airborne with the speed we took off. Before we could say anything Paul told us about how three men from across the street stood under a tree just watching him. 
He waved, but they didn't move a muscle. We just drove as fast as we could until we got back to the highway. To this day I will still have a nightmare every so often about that gas station and what my imagination has twisted buffer night into being. 1. There is a town right near me in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Lincoln Way in Clareton, Pennsylvania, where a whole street full of families disappeared overnight back in the 70s. Everything, bills, food, clothes, etc., was left behind, no trace of them to this day. You can go on Google Maps and look it up, the houses are abandoned and almost closed off from the rest of the town. 2. There was another instance that I'll never forget, I read it here on a creepiest Google Map places. A man in Canada decided to drive until the highway stopped, sometime in the past couple of years. I believe he started in Winnipeg and kept going in slash NW until he ran out of road. About one to two hours, before he got to that point, he saw a lot of cars parked off the side of the road. Keep in mind that there wasn't a single gas station or store nearby and haven't seen a house for quite some time. There were a lot of about 30 to 35 cars old cars, want to say from the 50s or 60s, and in the distance he saw a cavern entrance that was faintly illuminated by light. He noticed the tail end of a group of people dressed in all black walking in. No signs were around advertising it and he said he couldn't find anything about it on Google Maps. He posted this a year ago, and that trip was even further back from that. I reached out and tried to get any markers or nearby areas I could do my own research in, but he said he could not remember specifics. Still makes me wonder to this day what was going on there. My story is less creepy than it is odd, and I posted it before so you may have seen it. When I was 13 years old, I bicycled the Natchez Trace Parkway from Mississippi up to Nashville, Tennessee with my dad over the course of a week. As much as I know I complained about the difficulty, it was a great trip with some amazing bonding. I still can't believe my mother let me go. This would have been the late 90s. The most interesting story on the journey comes from the day from Belmont, Mississippi to Waynesboro, Tennessee. The previous day we had ridden further than we expected, 92 miles, because we couldn't find a motel room and weren't biking and camping on this trip, probably my mom's plea. Needless to say, we were a little tired from the previous day. It's a good 75 miles to Waynesboro, but we had a motel tour guide for the trip that said a small motor lodge would be available. The terrain was rolling hills, and they got more difficult after we crossed the Tennessee River in northwest Alabama, so we were ready to be done. We got off the parkway and went about four miles west. This little place wasn't actually in the town, it was just an old motor lodge along US-64. It looked straight out of the 50s and had one pickup and one semi-bobtail parked out front. It looked closed, and we were a little worried. There wasn't anything else listed in our guide, we were dead tired, and no one lives in this part of Tennessee. But we walked in and sure enough, a couple was at the window and ready to get us a room, in fact, they even had a small dinner that they were trying to get open, so we were welcome to join them for dinner. Awesome, you better believe we want to have dinner with you. We took a room and we were in fact the only ones there besides the trucker. We opened the door and, what was there? For starters, the walls were of that old faux wood board and had seen better days. The carpet was orange shag from probably the 50s or 60s. Maybe original to the building. The beds were hard. Oh, and it was about 95 in the room from the day's heat with no AC turned on which is perfect for after a long, hot bicycle ride. TVs had rabbit ears and got about 1.5 channels. This was 1,999 mind you. There was a huge old window unit that we turned on ASAP. Took cold showers to get the feeling normal while the others hung out outside with the door open and went to dinner to let the room cool off. No traffic on this road. Hardly a sign for the town a few more miles up the road. Back in the office slash diner, the lights outside were now on and it was obvious we were the only ones in for dinner. Food? Not that good, but you'll eat anything after a workout of 75 miles. But the folks who ran the place were just wonderful. A husband and wife, they had bought the motel days prior and were trying to get it running again. Would have been closed if we had been there a few days before. They were keeping the old place open while they started to redo rooms and get the dinner running. They talked about the place and how they wanted to start something like this, and how they hoped it would go. 
They were really interested in us as well, and probably listening to the tourist aspect of what we were doing on the bike trip. The gentleman said that he thought they could get some folks to the diner by introducing a karaoke night. He had just bought a machine and had it hooked up to a TV, but it wasn't working, and he couldn't figure it out. I offered to give it a shot, and I don't know exactly what I did, but after a couple of tries it was fixed again and he sang a song. And then the power went out. The couple brought out some candles and said that this had already happened to them twice now, but it wasn't them and they didn't know why it kept happening. We all talked in the dark for a bit and then we said our good nights. Went back to our room and it was still hot. Ugh. My father and I talked about the place, and he said that there was no way that their idea was going to work, but it was too bad, because they were nice people. Went pretty much straight to the uncomfortable beds. The power came on at some point before midnight. Next morning, we had a pretty good breakfast at dinner, and the couple was so apologetic. No, it happens. We were happy they were here. We wished each other luck and left after that. A few days later after we got to Nashville and took a bus back to get our minivan to go home, we stopped by again just to say hi. The place was closed up and locked up. No one was there. I've tried to look up the place again, but it's been a long time since demolished. I know the place failed under those folks, but they tried something and they were gracious hosts. One time I was hiking around Arkansas with my wife and lost track of time. We ended up being too late for a camp spot at our intended place, so we had to search for another one. Eventually we found a sort of ranch where the owners often let campers stay who had nowhere else to go, so all was good. It was a bit crowded with other campers so we had to ask these college-age kids if we could camp next to them on their spot and they agreed. The kids were nice and even helped with our tent but kept us up later than we wanted because they were loud and wasted well into the night. Anyway, we wake up in the morning and I'm just eating breakfast and getting ready and stuff when out of my eye, I notice someone coming out of our neighbor's tent, but I didn't recognize her. It was a woman who was much older than the kids from last night, followed by her small daughter. The college kids from last night weren't there but the actual stuff was the same. It was still their tent, their chairs, their car, same everything except for the people. It was really surreal, everything was literally the same about our neighbors except instead of them being four college kids, they had been replaced by an older family of three. Many years ago, my family and I moved from California to Nebraska. I was still a young kid, probably five to six years old. We were driving through Nevada and shortly after Las Vegas and we needed to stop and fuel up. We stopped at your typical old school gas station that rings when you pull up to the pump. I don't remember it that well, but my dad told me it looked normal. He got out to stretch while my mom went inside to pay for gas. My mom said that when she walked in, the gas station had quite a few people inside, despite us being the only car there. When she walked up to the counter to pay for gas, everyone turned to her, and the lights went out. She ran outside where my dad witnessed everything and helped her into the car and we sped off down the interstate, not caring whether we ran out of gas or not. To this day, my mom says that's one of her scariest encounters because she can't explain nor figure out exactly what was going on. And yes, we found a better gas station down the road and made it to Nebraska. Back in the day my dad had a company that rented out 4 by 4 vehicles to foreigners who wanted to explore rural Africa. These cars were kid out for off-roading and rarely broke down. But this time one did. My dad had to retrieve the vehicle as he's done a few times before, and since we lived in the neighboring country it wasn't more than a 20-hour drive, we live in Cape Town, South Africa, and the vehicle broke down in Namibia. To my delight my dad was setting off to retrieve this 4x4 in the upcoming school holiday and asked me to join him. I should add that I was about 16 at the time and ghost stories never really got to me. So, we set off on our long journey and the trip went smoothly as planned. We get to the collection point, hook up the broken down 4x4 to ours and off we go, no problems at all. Until it turned dark. Now I know Namibia quite well, it has some well-known ghost stories, ghost towns and other eerie occurrences have been reported, but in my mind that was just fantasy. Fast forward to about 2.30 am, remember kids, nothing good ever happens after 2 am, and my dad wakes me up with noticeable uneasiness in his voice. He asked me to look in the rearview mirror and tell me what I saw. I looked in the mirror and noticed two dim headlights almost on our rear bumper that appear to be bouncing around a bit. 
My dad told me he wanted to make sure I see it too, and it isn't just his tired eyes playing tricks on him. I looked around, and the area we were in was terrifying to say the least. We were surrounded by hills, but because of the lack of light it was just pure blackness against the night sky, covered in leafless trees with pointy sharp branches all over. I asked my dad where we were and he simply said that he doesn't know, he's just been following the GPS and asked me to look if there were any towns nearby. There wasn't, not for more than 300 kilometers. He pointed back at the mirror and said look. He then proceeded to shift over the center of the road to the other lane and the lights followed suit without hesitation, as if they were tied to us. I asked my dad what it was, and he said that he thinks it's a truck, now that in itself is not uncommon on these long cross-country roads, but something about this just seemed off. I mentioned to my dad that the truck may simply want to pass us, we are pulling quite a bit of weight so we are way under the speed limit at this point and he could be impatient. Dad decides to slow down to 60 km per hour and moves into the yellow line in an attempt to get this truck to pass. Nope, truck slows down too. Okay let's take it down a notch, Dad slows down to 40 km per hour, nope same result. We had to drop down to a speed of 20 km per hour for this truck to start overtaking us. And then it did. We heard a groan and the grinding of gears and what seemed like an eternity till this truck started pulling up next to us. Now keep in mind these are quite windy roads with hills, so overtaking isn't recommended, especially not that slow, but this truck took its sweet time until it was right next to us. It was one of those car hauling trucks that has two levels that it can carry cars on. It had chains all over the sides that were slowly clinging and clanging through the night. The back of the truck where the cars get loaded appeared bent out of shape and the metal was rusted and held together by pieces of wood and loose torn pieces of fabric were blowing in the wind. I was terrified. I shifted my attention to the cabin, black as the sky that night and no driver in sight. I'm not making this up, we saw nobody. The truck pulled in front of us with a groan and it didn't seem like it could speed up anymore. Now we were behind this terrifying mess of a vehicle and my dad started getting impatient, we started overtaking the truck and checked again for life inside the cabin as we passed. Nothing. Once we were in front of the truck I noticed the headlights getting ever dimmer and dimmer, and when we picked up speed so did it. The lights kept dimming until there was, but a spark left. This is where I got convinced something supernatural was going on. We were driving on a hillside and a bend was coming up, not a tight one, but if missed one would go straight off the road and down the hill as there were no barriers. We go around the bend slowly, considering our heavy load and the truck just goes straight without hesitation. We both saw it drive straight off the road and down the hill where at the bottom it finally got to a stop and all the lights died. We stopped at a rest stop for the night and headed back there that morning to have a look to see if anyone was hurt or if the truck was there. It wasn't and there were no tracks or broken bushes where we saw it go off the road. Not just one, but there's a whole lot of places in rural NZ that will scare someone who isn't used to it. Hell, even some of my Kiwi friends would sometimes be like no I'm not hiking out there with you, good luck. If I had to choose one, we would do a 5-day hike and have pretty good maps and directions. Now there's a lot of nationally funded huts throughout the island, very well marked. We found this one random hut that was definitely not on the maps, with a bunch of older guys just hammered partying inside. And this was out of where these guys could have just walked up from town to party in for the afternoon. No gear whatsoever, just the craziest looking 60 plus guys hammered in this random unmarked cabin. When we came back later the place was absolutely empty and musty, so they packed up their trash, but it still seemed all gross and dirty. We were all kind of baffled, did we actually need all these crazy hillbilly old men partying in the middle of nowhere? They obviously weren't going up there to clean it up, and where did this cabin even come from just in the middle of these mountains? And how did they just randomly hike up there with cases of beer and alcohol and speakers? One time me and my friends went for a five-day hike in the Appalachian, Quebec site in the area known as Matan. It was about 60 kilometers in the hilly-slash-borderline mountainous landscape in the middle of nowhere and we saw a lot of wildlife, caribous mostly. Well, the third day of the hike, we were going from a summit to another, about 10k this day with a lot of elevation, it was hard, we had only a couple of access to water on the way so we were thirsty and the hike the day before to get to the summit was a very tough one so we were all still in pain from it. 
Well, in this context, imagine our surprise when we crossed path with two older guys, in their 60s, in freaking Crocs, you know, the plastic shoes, with a pack of beers, on the same trail as us, but in the opposite direction. They were going up to the summit we just left to spend the night there. They were part of the association who maintained the trail and did so for the past 20 years or so. We chatted a little bit and asked about their attire, well, as we found out they came through a smaller logging road only the locals would know about and just had to hike about 5k to get to the summit. I'm sure in your case it's the same thing, locals who knew about a trail or road to get close to the hut and occasionally went there to party in the middle of nowhere. There's this old, abandoned hotel a couple of hours away from me. It's not like a modern hotel, but like an old Victorian house that was turned into a BNB. It's totally boarded up, big fence around it with barbed wire. Apparently, it's pretty damn haunted. In high school me and some friends went to check it out. It's in the middle of this a circular road, not a roundabout, but you can go around several times before feeding back onto the main road. It takes about 90 seconds to go around this circle. Anyway, the first time we drive through all the shades on the windows are drawn. We drive around again, only half of the shades are drawn. The next time we drive by all the shades are open. We drove around one last time and all the shades were drawn again. We freaked out and drove the hell out of there. Near where I live there is a small town called Ridgeview Park. My friend was talking to a new girl, and we were scoping out where she lived so he wouldn't get lost on his upcoming date when we took a wrong turn. After a slight decline, the road sharply rose until we crossed some train tracks and were met with a fence about 20 feet tall made from wood pillars about the size around of telephone poles. There was a gate that was open, so we drove in. Once inside, there is a single loop that winds through the whole complex. Only wide enough for one car. One way in, one way out. In the middle sits a large dome slash church. The houses that surround it are all square two-story homes painted brightly in strange colors. There is a drained community pool off to one side with grass growing in the basin. Lined up along the very back of the loop are 50 to 70 single car garage doors, all right next to each other. No house appears to have its own. It was strangely quiet and as we drove past the homes, residents would step outside and watch us. The loop isn't too large, and we eventually made our way around and exited through the gate and some people walked closer watching us leave. Haven't seen anything else like it. Their website is password protected, and their Facebook page is private. The part you can see says it is a summer community that started out as a Methodist camp and still has religious services, and that they only sell homes to members of the family. Such a creepy vibe to the whole place, and we try to drive through at least once a year, when the gate is open. Ten years ago, my friend and I were bored one night and were driving around. We were on a highway in NJ about 30 minutes from our houses and through the trees in the middle of nowhere we saw this beautiful freshly paved cement pathway with lampposts every 100 feet just lighting this pathway up. It was beckoning to us, and so we found the nearest exit. We drove around for a while through darkness until the road came to a dead end and the path began. We got out and started walking on this path through the trees and these beautiful wide open fields until eventually it ended at a little small town after a couple of miles. At this point it's like 2 a.m. and a small town like this nothing should be open except for this pizzeria. Which is odd, so we go in. It is empty except for the older gentleman behind the counter. We order and start eating, then another older customer walks in. The gentleman behind the counter and this customer does a double take at each other and then smile. Both of them run around the counter and embrace, Mario. Stefano. What has it been 40 years? They talk the whole time about their childhood and growing up back in Italy. We think what the chances are we would be here. At this moment. Seeing friends reunited after 40 years, plain odd. My friend and I finished, and we headed back down the brightly lit path and back to the car and called it night. Ever since that night my friend and I tried to find that brightly lit path, but to no avail we haven't seen it since from the highway or driving down that road. In the small town the pizzeria is there, but it closes at 10 p.m., so no explanation why it would be open at 2 a.m. Plain odd and something we never could explain, experiencing an unlikely moment to watch friends be reunited after 40 years. 
I was relocating across Texas and, as I normally do, was driving through the night to skip traffic and because it's more serene that way. I was driving straight through central Texas going northwest, so seeing the hill country change to desert in the full moon was super cool. Anyways, I was driving with my, now ex, wife and we were running low on gas. Luckily, we were pulling into a tiny no-name town, and we could see an old gas station come around the bend. This encounter happened at about 2 a.m. Now, this town only has one road, and this station was right at the edge of town at the end of it. When I say old, I mean very old, the type that you have no option of prepaying, you simply flip up the handle on the machine and you hear the pump inside start struggling to get the gas from the reservoir. It had the old-style tick readers too, not a thing electrical on it. I, being the young man I was, had never seen one before, so I walked into the store to buy the gas before I pumped. The store only had one light in the far back on, and I almost thought it was closed since it was barely brighter inside than it was out in the moonlight. Upon entering, I saw the place was deserted, no customers, no workers, nothing. However, there was an odd tune playing on someone's radio that I couldn't place. An old-sounding, upbeat piano piece was playing somewhere around the corner inside, and I heard shuffling once I walked closer to the source. This place made me feel scared. Not the whoa this is creepy scared, but the all hairs are on end, something is seriously wrong here, but I can't figure it out scared. As I turned the corner, I saw a young man standing next to a large radio and dancing. His dancing, though, was extremely off-putting and seriously didn't match the tune at all. Though the radio was cranking out what sounded like ragtime, this guy was running his hands up and down his body and pretty much feeling himself with his eyes closed in what looked like bliss. He was going far slower than the music and definitely wasn't on tempo. For some reason, I couldn't speak. I couldn't even move. I was in a trance as every part of me screamed to turn and leave. Finally, I said, excuse me, I just need some gas. The guy kept dancing. I said it a little louder, and he finally slowed down a bit and opened his eyes and focused on me. But it was like he was looking at a finely cooked steak. He was looking almost through me, and silently walked to the register, not saying anything. I said, uh, just twenty dollars please. He, again, didn't say anything and just stood behind the ancient register, so I just figured maybe he didn't speak the language or was embarrassed I caught him dancing, so I laid the money on the counter and went outside hoping he'd turn on the pump. I filled up, told my wife about the weirdest scene in there, and turned off the pump to kill the horrible grinding noise from the interior pump fighting against gravity to get the gas up. The weird thing is, when we were leaving, I looked back in the window when the guy was still standing there behind the counter. This may sound fine, but my money was still on the counter in front of him. It was like he was a robot who just turned off once I left. This is where it gets super weird. A couple of months later, I was driving back to San Antonio to visit family, and we figured we'd stop at that old gas station to see it in the daytime since it had become somewhat of a running joke between us. We pulled into this tiny town, and the thing was gone. The lot it sat on at the end of the road wasn't even there. It was just grass. No rubble, no old pump, no lighting, nothing. It was like somebody picked it up and moved it. It looked like nothing had been there for years. Still get freaked out thinking about it. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, share and subscribe. The Internet Surfer on YouTube for more horror and scary stories.